Now, what do you tell your clients who are sitting in the US mm. and saying, what do we do with emerging markets right now? How difficult is it to convince somebody in the US today that he should leave the safe harbor of growth in his own country mm. to actually look at something like emerging markets? Yeah, I mean, that's a tough sell, the, the kind of, the monster of this bull market has been the S&P, particularly to US-based investors. Um, it's just kind of crushed every contrarian call that anyone has wanted to throw at it. Um, one of the good things about last year is that EM kept up with the S&P, if, mm. if anything, outperformed it a little bit. Um, one of the things that helped there is that the dollar was weak last year, and there's a, a, a close relationship between the performance of emerging markets and the dollar. So weak dollar, good emerging markets. And I'm afraid one of the things that's changed this year is that the markets are now starting to think about a stronger dollar again. And so I'm afraid the S&P just carries on powering on, and EM uh, are struggling now to keep up with it. Uh, the general pitch I use, and we are overweight EM, uh, the general pitch I use to clients is that they look relatively cheap compared to the S&P. So trading on the, whatever, 10, 20% discount relative to the, to the level of uh, the S&P, valuations in the S&P. So it's a value trade, but it does need the dollar to be weak to really work. Do you have a call on the dollar? Do you believe that it might actually strengthen, putting pressure on EMs? Yeah, our view on the dollar is that this current rally that you're seeing will peter out. Uh, there was a similar rally in September, October, when I was getting asked all the same sorts of questions mm. about you know, dollar strength. Does that turn your strategy around? You're overweight EM. That's the wrong thing to do um, when the dollar is strong. Um, at the moment, the dollar's rallying because people think that the U.S. economy is outperforming the rest of the world and therefore the U.S. will tighten more than the rest of the world. That's kind of the reason why the dollar's rallying. However, we think that the twin deficits that are now being built up in the US, enormous ta unfunded tax cuts that need to be financed from uh, mm. overseas capital markets and so on, we think they will um, prove a drag on the dollar later in the year. So we think that the dollar strength that we're seeing at the moment will peter out. That should help EM to get back on their feet relative to, say, the S&P. The other issue which a lot of investors monitor carefully in their EM trades is what yeah. crude oil is doing. Mm. I mean, that's also sprung a bit of a surprise this year. Yes. Do you see it taking off $80 and going stabilizing at those kind of levels? Um, I mean, I was just talking with my commodity colleagues about the oil price um, earlier this week, and uh, they generally feel that this rally in the oil price will be capped partly by shale being turned on again in the U.S. There's this natural limiting mechanism in the U.S. They can kind of turn on production like the Saudis used to, you know, the Saudis have always been able to do. They can do that in the U.S. now. That's one of the profound differences between oil markets now and maybe 10 years ago. Mm. Um, we're getting up to the prices where it makes it worth their while turning the taps on in shale in the US. Mm. And when we get up to these prices, it, that performs it, that, that provides a cap. And we think the cap is, we, what we think break even on shale is probably 60, 65, 70. So the taps are going to be turning on as we speak. Mm. As those taps turn on, they will provide a cap and then drive all down a little bit, maybe to the sort of seven, 65, 70 type region mm. uh, towards the end of this year and into next year. So we think that the kind of upward march in oil will be capped by uh, shale later this year. That's demand and supply, but there's a wild card in geopolitics. Of I mean, course. Uh, I mean, what the U.S. is doing in Iran, do you Clearly. keep an eye on that? I mean, how do you see of that panning we, out? Uh, yeah, of course we do. And that's the great unpredictable mm. factor um, is what's going on in the Middle East. I think what, one of the very interesting things about Middle East politics is one of, the way, one of the reasons that the West took a lot of interest in it over the last 30 or 40 years, of course, is through the mechanism of the oil price. Mm. So if things flared up in the Middle East, the Western world really cared about it because it fed through into the oil price. Mm. What shale in the U.S., and, 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 and you've got to remember that in a strange sort of way, it doesn't exactly work like this, but it's made the U.S. self-sufficient in oil. That's an enormous difference compared to 20, 30 years ago when OPEC ruled the world, right? Um, is the U.S. being a self-producing oil economy means that their sensitivity to Middle East politics is reduced. So it allows the US to be a little bit more isolationist, right, mm -hmm. uh, politically, and it limits the ability of Middle East politics to really drive the global economy in the way that it was able to do, of course, profoundly in the 70s. Um, so I think, you know, again, I wouldn't underestimate the impact and, of, of, of shale and how it's changed the, the game in terms of the oil price. That's why 
even with Middle East politics hotting up, as we can clearly see is going on right now, we don't necessarily mean think that will translate into an oil price of $100 plus, which in the old world it m might well have done. Mm. So you would say that if you had to rank risks, you would say are the possibility of a trade war is actually a bigger risk mm. than geopolitics this year? Yes, I think. Um, and, and of course, trade wars are a little bit connected with geopolitics, but maybe mm. geopolitics feeding through into trade war, mm. trade wars, is a bigger deal than geopolitics feeding through into the oil price, which is the way we used to think of it. Mm. Geopolitics feeding through into trade wars, we think, is probably more of a, and, and it's less of a kind of short-term threat. You don't suddenly see trade collapsing by 20% in the way you can see the oil price going up by 20%. Mm. But I, we think it's a more profound challenge to uh, the global economy and therefore global stock markets, perhaps, than, uh, than, than, than the old challenges we used to watch in terms of geopolitics and the influence that had on the oil price. Where do things stand right now with the trade war thing uh, from the <sighs> recent dialogue that yeah. we've been hearing? I mean, it's hard to tell, right? Mm -hmm. So we get aggressive projections coming out of Washington and then they step back mm -hmm. and then they go aggressive again and then they step back. So we're um, what's the old saying? You should take the president of the U.S. seriously, but not literally, <laughs> right? We used to take him literally. We now take him seriously. So, but we understand that it's everything's negotiable. That's the thing that we're learning. So you get these big statements. You shouldn't take them too literally because, of course, then concessions are made and exceptions are made and all of these sorts of things. But. It does look like the, 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 the trade talk is now narrowing into China talk. Mm. It started off being trade talk and we were sending out to our clients all sorts of discussions of who trades with the US, this country, that country, that country, mm. this country, Mexico, Canada, all of these sorts of things. And actually it looks more and more like being a, a China trade issue as opposed to a global trade issue, if that makes sense. Sure. You're underweight India, though. You're mm. bullish emerging markets mm. overall, but within that context, you're not very bullish on India, mm. relatively speaking. Yes. Is it just a function of crude oil or other issues? Um, no, I think the main issue that my EM strategy colleague, Marcus, uh, Marcus Roskin, would, would highlight, uh, he's a bit of a value guy, and he always thinks that India just looks a little bit expensive. You know, mm. we've got an asset class that we want to buy because it trades on a relatively cheap multiple 13, 14, 15 times, which is what emerging markets do. Mm. But I'm afraid India trades on 19 times earnings. Mm. So it's a bit more of a valuation call. We like India, we just think a lot of it's in the price. You're saying we might grind out 7, 8% kind of gains in the second half of the year. Yeah. What would make you relook at that hypothesis? What will have to change for you to say, look, this is probably not going to happen now? Um, I suppose I'm watching, in a funny sort of way, I'm watching, I know everyone else is, as you said earlier, fixated by bond deals hitting 3%. Mm. I'm watching more closely some lead indicators of the world economy rolling over. So what we call, for your uh, viewers, purchasing manager indicators, which mm. are kind of business confidence indicators, which tend to capture how the economy is doing earlier than if we sit around waiting for industrial production or GDP figures or so on. In some parts of the world, those are rolling over. They, they were positive and rising last year. Mm -hmm. Now they're still positive, but they're falling. Um, that is starting to influence things like interest rate expectations, currency markets, and so on. And I worry that that rollover could turn into something more significant. We're nowhere near um, that level yet, but I'm starting to get asked about, do you think that we've seen the peak? level of acceleration of this cycle. This cycle is decelerating. It's still positive. It's decelerating. Do you think that could actually be two years down the line at turning into a global recession? So I'm probably more worried about those rolling over PMIs, as we call them in the jargon, than I am about high interest rates. But this is an imp interesting point because uh, a lot of people that we speak to are beginning to watch over their shoulder a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's because you're quite late in the cycle. Yeah, yeah. It could extend two, three years more. Sure. But it's reached that point, right, where people are beginning to get a little cautious about how much longer we can extend this bull run? Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and so that's where our bear market checklist with its 18 factors comes in. And, we're st you know, on that, I'm just not getting enough boxes ticked. However, there are some quite late cycle type things that are going on out there. Credit spreads are rising, so that's the difference between corporate bond uh, borrowing rates and treasury rates. So the risk premium that people 
asked for in the markets to take on credit risk, those are starting to rise. Mm -hmm. That's a classic late cycle thing. The VIX is starting to rise. That's a classic late cycle thing. PMIs are starting to roll over. That's a classic late cycle thing. So there are three or four of them falling into place, as I said, but lots of other things are missing. Big flows into markets are missing. M&A is picked up, but it's not as high as it would normally be at the top of the cycle. Equity issuance is picked up, but it's not as high as it would be at the end of the cycle. CapEx is picking up, but it's not as high as it would be at the end of the cycle. So, yeah, if you wanted to pick lots of late cycle things, I could find you three or four that tick the box. But I could also find you 10 or 11 that don't. Mm. But going by past instance, because you've been around for a long time, mm. when you get into the late stages of a yeah. bull run, I... Is it easy to spot that point where you say that maybe we should have turned from here, we should have become mm. more cautious, or does it manifest itself mostly on hindsight? Um, also, obviously, everything's really easy to spot in hindsight in this game, right? Um, I mean, that's why we, we try and come up with these disciplined lists, <clears throat> because at any one time, there will always be reasons to sell and reasons to buy. That's why the price is where it is, right? Sure. Um, I just don't see enough reasons to sell now. I can see some reasons to sell, but I just don't see enough. And when we see more of our 18 boxes, maybe 8, 9, 10, we're not going to wait for 18, of course. Mm. When we see more of our boxes being ticked, when M&A is strong enough, for instance, or IPOs are strong enough, for instance, then I think that's the moment to start flagging some caution. I do get some investors saying to me, I don't even care about the last two years of a bull market because I'm running the risk, of course, of running into the first year of a bear market, and you lose a lot more in the first year of a bear market than you make in the last two years of a bull market. So the risk reward doesn't add up. So depending on your risk profile, um, squeezing the last bits of juice out of the last two or three years of a bull market can be a dangerous thing, right? Mm. But you you would, if you were to hazard a guess, you would say there might be a couple of years left in this? Yeah, these, this point in the cycle, this kind of as I said to you at the beginning, this switch from a low vol to a high vol bull market. This high vol bull market you tend to, more to get towards the end of the cycle typically lasts a couple of years. Mm. And you know the last bear tipping over from a bull to a bear cycle mm. happened because of an accident. Do you think this one also will be precipitated mm. by an accident or does it roll over seamlessly or smoothly? That's a, I mean, that's a question I always get asked. What's the catalyst, Rob? <laughs> I'm very good at spotting catalysts in hindsight. <laughs> OK, um, I don't know. But what I can do is lay down the conditions that mean that whatever event occurs at the top of the market turns into something much more serious than just a bull market setback, right? I mean, let's think about, think about the crash in 87. I was mm. around back then. We're still arguing over what the trigger was for that. The point is that the elastic in financial markets got stretched too wide and then something happened that snapped that elastic back. The, the elastic right now is starting to stretch. I don't think it's at 87 type levels. There will be something, if we carry on in the way that I think, that will fall into place on D-Day in two years' time that will snap that elastic back and, and perhaps we'll all say, aha, that was the trigger. I don't know. All I can say to you is that I think the elastic is stretching, but I don't think it's right at the extreme yet. Robert, a great pleasure talking to you. Thank you very Thank much you for your time.